Hello and welcome to our um, chat about World Book Night. It is World Book Night this evening and uh, we've gathered a, a whole bunch of us who are really enthusiastic about books and love <laughs> reading. And so uh, today with us we've got um, Sarah Mears from Libraries Connected. Hi. Hi Sarah. We've, we've got Ian Anstis from Cheshire West Libraries. Hello! <laughs> I've definitely heard Ian. And we've also got uh, Sarah and myself from Berry Libraries. Hello. We just wanted to kind of get together and talk a little bit about World Book Night and to, to promote some of the things that are going on and talk through it. And so when me and Sarah were discussing this, we, we were trying to work out the history of World Book Night. And the uh, together we kind of scrapped some things down and we talked a little bit. And then we went to uh, the Library Oracle um, Ian Anstess <laughs> and so Ian I don't know if you are able to why don't you tell us what World Book Night's really about and uh, some information about that. Well David I've done some serious research on the subject and I can partake of these facts with you today. I hope you're taking notes hopefully of pen and paper possibly in your case parchment. So <laughs> will there be a book test? World Book Night, this is a special year for World Book Night, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the 10th anniversary of World oh, Book no. Night. Yes. If you cast your mind back to the halcyon days of the 5th of March 2011, that was when the first World Book Night started. Um, and that was very nice, but UNESCO, United Nations something or other, decided... Hmm, 5th of March doesn't do it for us. So they thought, what other day can we move it to? So they thought, what day did William Shakespeare die? That would be a good one. Oh, no, sorry, what day he was born? Um, it just happened to be the same day, um, allegedly. So they moved it to the 23rd of April for next year, just to confuse everyone. Uh, and it's been on the 23rd of April uh, ever since. Um, the USA came on board with it uh, a year or two later. Um, it, it started off because a, a publisher thought, hmm, there's this thing called World Book Day that's happening. Um, and World Book Day had been happening for years so now we need a world book night did i say world book night at the beginning or did i say world book day i'm sure you said world book night good because it is very confusing this because yes. clearly if there's not been a massive amount of imagination with a naming <laughs> because the publishers thought i really like world book day which had been going on for absolutely ages at that point 1995 <laughs> was the first time oh, that right. World Book Day happened. I was uh, only 25 then, I had hair. Um, and so they thought, right, okay, let's go for World Book Night because World Book Day is for kids. World Book Night uh, is for the adults because presumably adults are working during a day and being boring wage earning people uh, and in the evening they can party with a book. So they did that and, you know, it was all lovely because what happened was the publishers got together a list of free books. And I've discovered that people really like free stuff. Um, I particularly <laughs> like free stuff, ladies and gentlemen watching. Um, if you want to send me anything, feel free. Um, Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so um, particularly chocolate biscuits. Um, so, hmm, will chocolate biscuit night. It's a thought. Mm. Um, so, um, so I remember World Book Night at the beginning for having loads of free books, which we could order and members of the public could order um, from, from ourselves. So we had big bundles of free books, which we then gave out. I remember pushing a shopping trolley around uh, Winsford Town Centre back in the early days and handing out free books to people. And it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. We, we, we joined up quite a few people that way. Um, almost got arrested, but that's another story. Um, so, the, um, so that happened. And But just recently, it's changed its focus. So we're not giving books away just for people who um, 
we see on the street. We're giving people giving people away, giving books away <laughs> um, to um, to people who actually need them, who have um, who ha don't read normally, or perhaps don't have a spare cash for for books. So often. Um, there is library services are giving away for books and there's about 20 or so in the list each year. They give the books away to um, homeless shelters and to food banks and, and places like that, which I think is is really glorious. Um, and, and then we get to this year and things have changed slightly. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you noticed the last month or two, something odd is going on. Uh, and, and so handing out books in the street to large numbers of people is perhaps not the most viable option this year. So very cleverly, it's decided to push it all online. Um, so for uh, things like for, and I do love this name, for National Shelf Service. Can we all go, <laughs> oh. Oh. The National Shelf Service, which is a uh, Silip YouTube channel, um, Silip has a YouTube channel. Uh, Silip, ladies and gentlemen, is the National Association for Professional Librarians. And the idea of it having a YouTube channel blew my mind when I discovered it. <laughs> uh, and it has librarians each day um, reviewing books. And to, um, today, um, it will be having hourly book reviews um, starting from 11 a.m. Um, with a celebrity joining at 7 p.m. And I had to check out how to pronounce this chap's name. Um, Sarah, Sarah and David, you can mark me out of 10 for this one. Um, Joseph Coelho, is that right? Coelho. Coelho? Yeah. Joseph Coelho. Um, will... Uh, who is a children's poet and author, will be doing a special story time at 7pm on the National, South Sur Sh National Shelf Service YouTube channel. So for Youth Libraries Group at Youth Libraries, if you're hip and trendy and on social media, um, we'll be answering book questions and also recommending books uh, all day today using the rather cool hashtag, I think, of hashtag Dr. Book, DR Book. Isn't that cool? So you can you can tweet them or presumably Facebook them, if that's the term. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they will recommend a book to you. And that, my <laughs> friends, is a potted history and explanation of World Book Night. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ian. That is done in the way that only you can do that, isn't it? <laughs> a mixture of incredible stories. In me yes. mixture of incredible facts, great enthusiasm, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just Madness. an incredible, incredible, yeah, the unknown. I think that's what we'll call it, the unknown. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks so much for that, Ian. When you were talking about walking around a town centre with a supermarket trolley full of books, Dave, um, Ian, I did the similar thing at Hollingworth Lake one World Book evening, well, one World Book night. And uh, my kids were windsurfing on the lake, and I walked around the lake with a huge arms full of books, <laughs> giving them out to random people that were passed. And it, it was really good fun, but everybody treated me with a lot of suspicion. <laughs> we had um, one one year, um, one library uh, arranged it with for train service, a local train service. Sandy oh, that's Road. good. Yeah. To actually go on the sandy way to Chester train and to hand out books to presumably quite surprised people um, in carriages, and that went on. So, that, that did so well that he did it again for the next couple of years afterwards, which I thought was lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Good contact with people that we get through this job, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And uh, as you said, Ian, obviously things have changed quite a lot because of the the circumstances that we're in and the the way that world book nights taking place has uh, adapted and sarah it would be amazing if you would tell us a little bit about um some of the stuff that's going yeah, on yeah so i mean i think the, the the big thing really will be at 7 p.m 7 to 8 p.m is going to be called the reading hour and we just really all the all the partners involved in world book night want people reading at that hour and that could be reading to your children before bedtime. It could be reading for yourself. It could be reading to the cat. It could be reading to anybody. And um, we want to know who, who, what you're reading and who you're reading to. And um, so we've got two hashtags, World Book Night, hashtag World Book Night and hashtag Reading Hour. And um, if you can 
share your photographs and uh, of the books you're reading so it creates a big recommendation kind of hour of great reads that we can all borrow and use and read mm-hmm. and over the next few weeks um, and, and as Ian said um, if you're reading to children then um, Joseph Crayle will be doing an amazing and I know I've seen him do it an amazing story on YouTube at 7 p.m. Um, go just search YouTube National Shelf Service to watch Joseph Crayle in action because I think he's going to be absolutely brilliant. So um, something to look forward to. Keep us all cheerful um, from there. And then front row, BBC front row at seven fifteen uh, is going to ha- share one of the stories that's one of the free giveaways for World Book Night, an ebook, and it's going to be a short story from bedtime stories from stressed out adults. So uh, a bedtime story for adults also with a celebrity who we can't reveal yet, but a celebrity will be reading that on front row. So that's good to watch out for in that hour as well. Amazing. That sounds like a there's there's a plethora of things going on, aren't there? It's brilliant. Um, and so within that, um, is there anything anything else in particular, Ian, at Cheshire West that you'd like to mention? Well, we're we're piggybacking uh, completely shamelessly uh, upon for national offer uh, and pushing that. But there is also something amazing which has happened um, during the extended quarantine is that so many more people are using libraries digitally now for never before. Um, and so what we will be pushing is, yes, yes, okay, you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, but tell a friend they can also join for library service um, digitally as well, and, and we'll be sharing for links to do that, because you don't actually need to have ID uh, in order to join to bow, to bow ebooks and so on. And uh, we've invested quite a lot in new ebooks now, and, the, and because you know, people can get into our physical buildings. Uh, and there's a really nice range of both adult and children's books there. Uh, and so we'll be suggesting to people to tell their friends about it, which they jolly well should. I think that's everywhere. We're all really pushing our online memberships, aren't we, and our access to e-books and audio books through library um, websites. It's, and you can't, I can't tell enough people that that's how they can access books really easily because... Um, what we've been doing in Bury with the hubs and things and chatting to members of the public. And I've been saying, well, you know, you can get online and join and you don't need to physically access a building. And it, it's just so beneficial to people to be reading at the moment. It's such an escapism, isn't it, from the current... And it's a social thing as well, chatting on Zoom and things with friends and reading groups about books. Good. One of uh, one of the things I noticed when I was doing a research, which I cleverly forgot to mention, um, <laughs> was you know because I'm a professional, um, was about a third of people don't regularly read, uh, and that goes up to almost half of young people, certainly for for fun and for leisure. Mm. Um, but but what a good time to start, you yeah. know, um, in these days. Um, and we were just talking a, a bit earlier before before we got off the ground about imagine what would have happened in the 1980s um, mm-hmm. when if a quarantine had, had happened then. I mean, it would have been terrible. But, but luckily now with the internet, people can actually access a world of information online and, and also a ton of free ebooks mm. um, through a local library service. So now's the time to take advantage of it. Absolutely. I think there's lots of um, lots of libraries are doing story times and rhyme times online and you don't have to be a member of any one library service to take advantage. So it's, it's worth uh, you know checking out a range of library services for their rhyme times and story times. And um, yeah, so we're, we're promoting them as well with a shameless plug from Libraries from Home, hashtag Libraries from Home, where we are promoting this and the, and the greatest of the library rhyme times and story times for people to join in every day. It's brilliant though, isn't it? Because <laughs> what, what happens in those moments is, is that the library is able to go to Amazing. people, isn't it? And we reach yeah. out to people. Um, I know Sarah did, uh, had a, Sarah's been doing one for Berry, and she started last week. And some of my friends who are in London, um, they text me and they, they'd they seen it. And uh, her, her thing straight away was <laughs> we, she was talking to me about it. And then we we worked out that their local library obviously runs a, runs, um, a rhyme time normally. And so it's like, you know, hopefully when all this ends, she's going to take her daughter 
to, to rhyme time there. And th none of this happens, but for people seeing this and, you know, people who maybe never would have walked into a library suddenly, um, you know, we get to intrude to their news feed and they get to, <laughs> to see the brilliant things that take place in, in libraries, which is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. And it's fantastic how it, how quickly uh, uh, libraries have been able to transfer their physical activity to virtual activity. I think it's been phenomenal. Me too. Me too. Um, and we're really privileged to have uh, you guys with us today. And one of the things, um, I, you know, you are genuinely both, uh, well, all three of you, I include Sarah Howell in that. From Berry. Are you sure? Yeah, she's... <laughs> Careful now, David. All three of you are um, absolutely brilliant in, in what you do and have been doing this for years and years and um, really love libraries and love reading. And within that, I, one of the things I, I wondered is just what was it for you that um, started off this love of reading? And uh, I'm going to put it to um, Sarah from LC. We are absolutely, um, well, we're, we're just really happy that you've been able to join us today. Yeah, what are. was it What was it for you that started your love of reading? Um, I think it was my dad reading to me. My dad read to me every night when I went to bed from a you know, very young age. And um, he took me to the library, joined me to the library. I was re reflecting on that the other day. And I remember that when I started joining, when I joined the library, it feels like a long, long time ago. You couldn't join the library until you were five. And he took me when I was four and he lied and said I was five. <laughs> and Good man. I couldn't join the library. And I was so shocked that my dad had told a lie, my very fine, outstanding dad, but he was so passionate about the importance of books and, and the fact that, you know, in the library, I would have access to thousands of books. So I think that was what, you know, that nighttime reading, bedtime stories and being taken to the library from a very young age. And then I can remember going to the library with my friend, uh, Jackie, and we used to take our bikes and we'd all walk back reading to each other from the books we chose in the library. So we were already starting to connect and engage through books. And so, you know, I was I was a reader from that point onwards and I've never stopped really since then. Yeah. Amazing. I, I, I just love stories like that that start with like a, you know, a slightly dubious uh, or immoral start. Like my, my dad told a lie, but, uh, but, but, but don't worry about that because now we're, that got me in. Making libraries <laughs> dangerous and exciting. Um, Absolutely, yeah. What about you, Mr. Anstess? Um, well, for the first book I can remember borrowing from a uh, library was from the, from the school library service. And I remember feeling very guilty when we moved house and didn't return it. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess that's highly dubious, isn't it? But um, two, two books in particular I remember, which um, I think have shaped my, shaped my reading over a few years. The first was um, a wonderful book on the Roman army, because of course, being, being a boy, I was fairly bloodthirsty in those days, um, um, which had the most superb illustrations and lots of really meaty facts and text. And, and I, I really got into, into that book in a big way. And the second one, which that one decided uh, I'd be interested in history for the rest of my life. And I still am now. I follow it really avidly. But for the second thing is, I remember reading a book when I was in comprehensive school um, called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, <laughs> which was unlike mm -hmm. any book which I'd read before. And I'm really pleased to say it's actually on the World Book Night list this year. I was just checking um, that. I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... Um, that, that bowled me away for several reasons. One, it, there were so many memorable characters. I mean, for a severely depressed robot um, called Marvin, um, <laughs> absolutely superb. I, I could really associate with um, being a teenage boy um, with someone <laughs> who, who was both very depressed but also very aware of how intelligent he was compared to other people. And I think it's only teenage boys that really get away with that. And um, so I, I associate it with Marvin straight away. Um, but but that was that was a book which I read where there was, um, I mean, just hilariousness on every page. There, there were lines which you go back to and think, that is really clever. And 
that got me interested both in science fiction but also in a in a humor side so i went from there on to terry pratchett but also on to wonderful things like ian m banks uh, and all for and all for soap operas uh, i'm not a highly cultured reader uh, as you can tell uh, i like things with spaceships laser battles and jokes <laughs> You make that sound like that that's not okay. And, and one of the best things mm. about reading is that absolutely, you know, anything is okay, isn't it? Like yeah. there are so yeah. many different types of books and I'm always really cautious when somebody, like I'm happy to recommend books that I've enjoyed, but I'm always really cautious with it as well because I feel like it's, um, it's a really personal thing, isn't it? You feel like you're going to be judged yeah. if, you know, someone goes away yeah. and goes, well, I didn't like that guy recommended uh, this book. And I'm like, what is, no. And I've... I think also that there is, I mean, I don't think it's ever, ever spoken, but there is a sort of like in our minds a hierarchy of books. Absolutely. So, yeah. but for, for French philosophers <laughs> and whatever is on the Booker Prize, whatever it is now, um, it is for top level. So, so one is quite happy uh, reading those and anything of more than a thousand pages. Hello, Hilary Mantel. Um, but <laughs> but books which you can just sit back and enjoy and not learn anything from, but escape, mm. absolutely fantastic. And and in in a library, I recommend books like that to people all the time. And there's and there's no better time now uh, mm. for that because in in the book now you can talk to all sorts of people and you can travel to all sorts of places, uh, and that's quite hard at a moment um, <laughs> uh, in in other media. But with a book, you can do it. Absolutely. And I think at this, especially at this time when it's everyone's a bit stressed and a bit anxious, then just a, a kind of real comfort read is really, really important, isn't it? And re-reading old favourites as well. So you're kind of re-meeting old friends in books is, is a really absolutely. important so, thing. So reading a book with a chocolate biscuit, uh, I think absolutely, <laughs> absolutely banana in my view. And Mrs. Howell, Sarah. Hello. Why don't you tell but, us a little bit about you? And your well, journey? Like Sarah, um, I I think my reading memory started with going to the library. My mum always took me to the library, the local library, and I always borrowed books. Um, some of the books I remember reading as a child and really enjoying, were a bit, they sound a bit cliche, but I, I know we've chatted on the podcast about books we said we've read. We haven't, but I have read these. Um, with the Chronicles of Narnia books. Oh, and, um, yeah. Yeah, and I also had a massive thing for the borrowers. I used to love the thought that there was like a family squirreling away all your little bits of things to make <laughs> furniture out of and stuff, living in your house with you. So I used to love those when I was a child. And I've got massively fond memories of the library that I used to use as a child. And all the staff there were fantastic. It was great. So, yeah, that's probably where my love of reading comes from. But like you were both saying about the escapism at the moment, and I've read a couple of books in the past few weeks. Um, I read one called The Flight of Cornelia Blackwood by Susan Elliott Wright. And that was, there were so many elements of that because the little bits of her personality and things that happened that you could relate to as a mother. And then another one called Queenie by Candice Carty Williams. And that I enjoyed as well, the sides of her personality I could relate to. But they're such different characters and very different circumstances but you can see yourself in all these different characters so yeah I love the, I love reading and especially at the moment I think it really is a fantastic way of just taking yourself away absolutely I have actually also um applied because you could apply online for um an e-book e from the world book night so I'm hoping to hear that I've got one of those yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> I was to say, what, what about your reading? Um, well, for me, I, I've mentioned it uh, a few times on our podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but within that, yeah, um, I basically, I, I, I was read to as a child, really enjoyed that. But when we went to school, um, we used to go to the library school and uh, there was a fight for everybody to get the Where's Wally book, basically. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I was one of the boys in that involved in that unfortunately again and uh, what happened um in, in in ours was even if you were in possession of that particular where's wally book you would want to renew it because you were in possession um and uh, they got they got a little bit wise to this the librarians that we were dealing with and so it became a thing you had to give it in and then they would look for the next one and there was only ever a few 
um, obviously with the different colours on the front. And one day our, our teacher uh, just decided enough was enough. There was not going to be any more Where's Wally. And, and in <laughs> hindsight, when I've looked back, I think we must have been about eight uh, or nine. So it was probably time that we progressed. Uh, <laughs> I think there was a girl in our class reading Pride and Prejudice, and I was like, "No, I'm, 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 I'm looking for Waldo on page eight. Oh um, but, but at that point, our teacher just decided, "No more, where's Wally?" And so from there, I then uh, we were then like welcomed to look at the rest of the shelves. Very well, we were encouraged to do that, um, and so we we decided to do that. And I picked up a book that was kind of on display, and uh, it had a very interesting cover, and I didn't really know what it was. And I picked it up, and and this teacher looked at me and said. Um, no, you won't be able to read that. And I kind of thought, well, well, exactly. So I I am a boy. I'm a middle child. That explains a lot of things to people that, uh, who know me or, (laughs) yeah, or, or who have listened to the podcast. I do have a chip on both shoulders. And so at this point I was like, you've told me I can't do something. Challenge accepted. And so I, I took this book to the counter and, uh, the book was checked out and it was, uh, Harry Potter and, and it was, uh, at the time, I am 90% sure it was the Philosopher's Stone. And uh, I went to, mm. to to read this book. I took it away. And uh, and from there, honestly, just be, mainly out of spite to prove someone wrong, I, I just loved that. And then <laughs> it just, this, we talked about on the podcast a little bit about how, just kind of how it works and just kind of the way things fall together. And for me, it just, I was so lucky that at that point, I, I when I was growing up, it was I picked up a Harry Potter book and then I went on that journey with it. And this was kind of before Harry Potter was huge. And then I went on the journey with the Harry Potter books and was very fortunate of that because you that was just an incredible, incredible journey to be part of. And uh, it suddenly changed the perception of reading for younger people. People loved reading because of Harry Potter. And you then started to read other books and I read things like... The Chronicles of Narnia and stuff, and the little uh, the little thing that I must say because it'll annoy him, and I know he's going to watch, is that um, the person who checked that book out is David, <laughs> who I who is now my boss, and uh, and and, uh, and yeah, like I remember years ago we were talking, uh, we used to sh- like share an office, and we were talking, and uh, he was saying about like he used to work for Bolton Libraries and I was like, oh, all right, okay. And we both live in the same area. So we make, I said, you work in Little Lever Library? And he was like, yeah, school visits were a nightmare. And he's telling me all this. And then I was like, well, and he, and he was like, yes, during those years, I definitely would have done that. So he really, I think that quite upsets him a little bit that uh, that, that was me. I think it just, yeah, I think it reminds him of his age a little bit, but there we go. So, that, so that's me. So what about, um, Ian, what for you? What is what is it that you love about reading? Like, what is the best thing about reading? For you know, just it, no matter what, if people have kind of put books down during this time, if they've not picked them up, not had a chance to, or they've been too busy binging Netflix, what is <laughs> what is it about reading that is just the absolute the pinnacle? Really, what's the best thing about it? I f- I think it's the only medium uh, where you've got absolutely perfect special effects. There's, there's no problems at all. Um, there, there's no glitchiness when it comes to the screen. There's no Jar Jar Binks. That is, <laughs> that's how I do it. Um, f- you can be fairly sure of that. So, f- and the acting is superb. No one, no one loves their lines at all. So it's got one over on theatre as well as over as over films. And also it's, it's the only medium where you can look into people's minds as well <laughs> so so for, it is not a case of oh i i wonder what the emperor palpatine is thinking at this moment in time no no um in in the book you you actually know because because it says hmm emperor palpatine thinks he fancies a chocolate biscuit you know it is it, <laughs> it's, it's, it is is that sort of thing so so and i think you can lose yourself there and i notice when i'm watching a film now I'm I'm very lucky at the moment, and I've got a wife, wife and two kids, um, and and so we got a nice social unit, and we, and we watch TV and so on. But one of the downsides of that, ladies and gentlemen, is they do keep on talking, um, <laughs> and and they all, and they all want their channel on, and and so on. And I f- I find that if I want to watch my film, it, it is quite hard to hear it over over the annoyance that is my family 
So, <laughs> so being able to disappear with a book and say, oh, I'm feeling tired. Um, <laughs> go, go upstairs. Um, I have a headache. Um, uh, and and to and have a, an hour or two of quiet reading, being transported somewhere else, um, being able to understand what's going on um, with no distractions, because you're holding the book closer when you watch a TV. So there it is like surround sound. I mean, it is 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 all there. There's not much else in your vision. Um, it can it can really suck you in in a way that uh, I I don't find any other medium really does it for me. Well, I think probably what all of the things that Ian said, really, I think there's that kind of feeling of, you know, where you, t you take the book. And I think it's because you, well, unless you're reading an e-book, but if you're reading a book, it's kind of enclosed around you. It's almost physically, exactly, uh, the end of illustrating, it kind of encloses you. So you're, you kind of enter this other world and you get to know characters. And I think that's the, the, the most powerful thing for me when you're reading is when you close the, you know, the final page. And you really, really miss the people that you've mm. met in the book. Yeah. And actually, it's very hard because you're, you're you have a kind of transitional couple of days where you don't want to start a new book because you're still yeah. kind of somewhere in the world of the previous book. And and that that to me is a sign of a really good book that you're absolutely lost in it and nothing else matters except that world and those characters. Um, yeah, that's that's that's. That's what does it for me. I agree with that as well. What, what both of you said about when you're reading, because when you ask that question, David, I thought it is just for you when you're reading a book, isn't it? It's just you on, and the book and the characters in it. So, yeah, I agree with both of you there. And I think at the moment as well, sat outside in the garden with the sunshine, reading a book, what could be more normal? Nothing could do. It. It's fantastic. It's just how it should be. It is, isn't it? It's that ability to just be anywhere in the world with anyone in the world. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I loved what you said before, Sarah, about kind of going back to old friends. And, and the yeah. best mm -hmm. thing about that is they're consistent. They haven't changed. This is not a fire off at my friends, but um, it's like, <laughs> like you, the, David now <laughs> has no friends. The situation <laughs> hasn't changed, has it, for those people, no matter what you're no. facing in life. Yeah. Um, that is, it's an escape from this stuff, isn't it? And like, you know, if you listen to the news all day and you just look through your Twitter feed and there can be so much negativity with everything that's going on and so much bad news and yet mm. to just escape in a book for a period of time. I, um, I think that's a, a big thing now is not to listen to the news all day. That's yeah. absolutely the worst, worst thing you can do. Um, and one of the things which I, I was thinking is that... Um, Sometimes you can tell within a page or two that you're going to really love this book. And it's just what I think it was Sarah One was saying, <laughs> um, was, was, was that, um, yeah, you, you're, so, you're so sad when it ends. And I find myself just thinking back to a, a book weeks, months, years afterwards and rereading it and so on. Absolutely magic. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's real value in rereading? I mean, this is something we've talked about a little bit in the past, Sarah and myself. Um, yeah. Like, do you think there is huge value in it, uh, particularly Ian and Sarah, in like picking up a book, going back and rereading it? Um, or do you think that they are kind of uh, single serving like friends almost? For me, I think it's um, that the, the, there's a there's a sign of a good book is when you reread it and you enjoy it as much as you did or even more than you did the first time and sometimes I think there are, there's two different two different experiences for me one is that I I read I read a book and I thought this is an amazing book it's really special I reread it and actually it kind of loses something in the, in the second reading whereas other books uh, one of the ones I, I I had done fairly recently was Captain Corelli's Mandolin which I read when it came out and there was all the fuss about it loved it and loved it. Um, and recently reread it, but I was a bit worried about rereading it in case that happened. But actually, 
I, my love of it deepened through rereading. I just, I just, I remember laying in bed thinking, this is just such a good book. It's so well written. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, that sort of deeper experiencing of reading it the second time. So I think it's, it depends on the reader and it depends on the book itself, really, whether, you know, what the experience of rereading is like. But so I think it's always worth giving it a go. But the trouble is, there are just so many good books out there to read. Yeah. It's always a temptation to read something new as well. Mm -hmm. I always find myself uh, rereading a book, it takes the whisk out of it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's not like, is this going to be a good book or not? You know it's going to be a good book. Um, yeah. So so you can reread it again. So I have particular books which I reread every few years because, you know, my long-term memory isn't what it was. Mm -hmm. And you can really enjoy them time after time. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're a safe place to go into yeah. um yeah. there is you know what's going to happen there's no shocks and surprises don't watch for news um but <laughs> then, but so yeah for a, a lovely comfortable safe thing to do and i find you can really turn off um with turn off in a good way um with with a uh, we read book that um always when when i start a new book there's always that element of doubt and suspicion for the first few pages, you know, is this is this going to be worth my time or not? Whereas with <laughs> with with an with an old favourite, it's like with a good friend. No, I know we're going to have a good time. <laughs> Brilliant. And one final thing from me is just, um, and anyone can jump in at any point with this is like, if people are watching this and they're trying to, then they want a recommendation for that one hour uh, of something to start something that Ooh. you know to give a go maybe people who've not had chance to to read not have left it i know there was a period of my life where i just stopped reading for a while and then to get back in is quite difficult and if this was going to be their one hour to do that with and they were thinking do you know what i'm going to give it a go the kids are going to be in bed or or i'm just going to take myself off to a room and do it if they had one hour what book would you recommend or what yeah maybe one or two if you if you can't narrow it down my, mine's very, um, very me, um, a book that I've read and loved um, that a lot of people will laugh because they'll say you, all the books and you've chosen this. But I think um, Bridget Jones, his diaries are just amazing. Look at Ian's eyebrows and his protest. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so farcical and just so far away from true life. I love them. Yeah, so that'd be my choice, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me again in half an hour, I'll probably change my mind. So, but that, that's where I'm going today. We're just in the current situation. That's what I yeah. think would just be pure escapism. And the and irony of the man who talked about there being a tier of books and, you know, with some books we ranked <laughs> higher. And I you knew, said, I knew we were criticized. You said Bridget I Jones knew. and his eyebrows hit the ceiling, didn't they? Yeah, so. Sarah kept a straight face, true professional. No, Ian had to, to fall off his chair. <laughs> I've not read Bridget Jones. I must give it a go. Thank you for that recommendation. <laughs> well, there you go, you see. Okay, Mr. Eyebrows, have you got a... <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, I, I, uh, we've already established that I'm into into safe sort of reads and so on. So I have I have two genres which I particularly enjoy. One is history, one is science fiction. So if you, if you don't like science fiction, um, give it a go. Some of it is really interesting. Um, two ones as fantasy as well. I know, it's shocking, isn't it? So... There's, for fantasy side, there is um, a series by Jim Butcher called for Dresden series, Dresden Universe. Absolutely fantastic. Um, if you want pure escapism, if you want wizard detectives riding on Tyrannosaurus Rexes, killing zombies, fantastic. Excellent special effects. <laughs> Good series, go with it. Uh, and the other one is quite hard science fiction but fun as well, which is for Player of Games by Ian M. Banks, uh, which is such a beautifully imagined universe um, of a really advanced civilization that has it all um, and what they do with it and, and how they deal with others. 
Uh, and again, for, and we we're talking earlier about the telepathy almost of, of reading where you know what's in people's minds and how Ian M. Banks um, deals with the character, the, the title character of a play of games. Absolutely fantastic. And, and you can see yourself in that far future universe with everything on the play and still the problems happening. Uh, and that's one of those which I reread all the time. It's worth a go. Oh. Mm. Amazing. And that Sarah has bought you uh, a good amount of time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my, my recommendation, I think, would be actually non-fiction as well, um, just because, you know, it's great to read non-fiction sometimes too. And it's um, Fingers in the Sparkle Jar by Chris Packham, which is, all about him growing up as a young boy who had difficulties growing up, but you know was sort of healed and saved by his relationship with the with the natural world. And I think in days of kind of when we're really constrained and some of us probably haven't seen much of the natural world recently, it's just lovely to you know imagine yourselves in the shoes of that young boy, just exploring, being free, learning about the world, and, and finding his own place within it. Brilliant. Thank you. Absolutely. What brilliant. about you, David? What would you be reading for the hour? I, I am a strange reader, so I, I kind of uh, strange. Oh, that's true as well. Yeah. Please generally. <laughs> I, I will mix between um, like crime, th crime thrillers, and fiction in that way, and then I can read some really deep, self-searching uh, stuff. And so I think if you're if you if you would like like a crime thriller like Ian Rankin is is fab. Um, anything Ian Rankin if you've never never been there there's lots to get at and it's gritty and it's in my opinion it's great it's really well written and, and just I just like that I find that really good escapism um, I, I also like my favourite book of, of all time is Translations by Brian Friel it's a play it's not a great read and yet I would tell you to read it because it's, it's, <laughs> it's not a great read in the context of it's a play and it's so you're sat reading a script in effect yeah. but it comes as a book but um it's a phenomenal book. It's phenomenal. Mm. Like if you, it's different type of reading to you know reading like a, a thriller where you've just got uh, the narrative, whether it be in first person, second person, third person. But this is like um, because it's a play, it is different. But honestly, I think it's the best, the best book I've read, uh, best fiction book I've read certainly. Can I do another <laughs> recommendation? Can I? Can I? Can I? Please, <laughs> please sir, please. Ian, we cannot stop you, can we? <laughs> no, I, I have a very loud voice, yes. Um, so what we've not talked about for, for libraries provide some of it is um, audio books at the moment. So you can actually listen to talking books for your library. And I've recently taken advantage of the Cheshire West and Chester Council uh, e-audio service to, to listen to Made in Scotland by Billy Connolly, which I think is just... Just a superb book. I mean, one thing is it's really funny, obviously, but uh, but another thing about it is you get its real feel for um, this uh, this character growing up in a pretty Dan Wuff neighbourhood, uh, and the fact you can listen to it being spoken to you in in a very Scottish voice somehow adds all the more to it, uh, and you can listen to it while you're doing the well, not the ironing, because who does ironing anymore? <laughs> ah, um, but while you're doing the dishes and other stuff excellent so good um, and just just literally in the closing few seconds why don't you Ian it'd be great if you could tell us about uh, public library news and Sarah it'd be amazing if you could tell us about uh, libraries connected for those don't the, those don't know about those services so if you're really into public libraries, I guess Libraries Connected is the one for you. But if you want to know about the news of what's going on and so on, um, completely apart and separate from my day job of Cheshire West and Chester Council, uh, I produce a website called Public Libraries News, uh, which has got all the information collated and summarised for you. Give it a go. And um, Libraries Connected is a, a national charity that supports public libraries. And during the uh, lockdown, we've created our libraries from home pages where we're trying to gather all the exciting things that libraries are doing, all their online rhyme times, story times, Lego clubs. 
So we're gathering them all in one place and all of the sort of links to uh, all of the online services that you can access via your local public library. And there's a list of libraries on there using the Find My Library uh, app on there as well. So you can find your own local library. So, um, yeah. So Brilliant. And uh, our, our shameless plug is that at Berry we run a podcast. It's called Dinosaurs Didn't Read. Uh, it's it's meant to be a safe space really for reading. Sarah and myself and a colleague of ours, David, uh, get together. Well, he's the guy who, who actually served me the book at the library <laughs> all those years ago. Uh, we, the book we, server. <laughs> yeah. we, we got together, uh, we get together each month and we record a podcast together. Uh, we have loads of special guests um, and we just try and talk about books, recommend some books, speak to some fascinating people and generally try and do that in a friendly and fun and informal manner. Uh, we are planning to do some uh, isolation podcasts. Uh, it's going to be a, a weekly thing. We've got some great guests lined up. They're going to be slightly different uh, and they're coming in the next few weeks. So you can find us on Audio Boom, on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts or anywhere where you can find podcasts. Thank and you. Ian Anstas thinks we're a 6 out of 10 listen, so it's worth a go. <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least 6 out of 10. Some of the episodes... Hitting a solid seven. Wow. <laughs> Are they the ones with you on, Ian? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we just want to remind you uh, one last time that tonight at between seven and eight, there is the reading hour for World Book Night. And you are able to, we'd love you to join him for that. And uh, and just encourage you to, you know, in this period of time, grab a book, grab an e-book or e-audio book. If you look at your local library online, they will have an offering where you can get online, uh, you can get online resources. There's loads of stuff going on, but we just encourage you to read at this time and to give uh, reading a go again. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.